Well, I don't know how long this is going to take. Um, so maybe get out early, or uh, maybe I'll be like rambling really fast at the end. But let's get started. Nevertheless, my name is Corey Brown. I am pretty much everywhere under unique name. Or rather, if you see unique name, that is almost certainly me. So Twitter, GitHub, um, other, whatever. Uh, so this is about native web components right now, today. So um, that should have refreshed. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So let's start with questions. Um, kind of a joke, but actually, seriously, because I, there, um, web components, the concept, the, the specifications have been around in some form for like three or four years now. And some people have a really deep understanding of it. Some people have like never really heard of it or it's just kind of been mentioned, like what's this weird thing? Um, so I'm curious, who knows, who knows about web components? Uh, who's heard of it? Who's used web components? Who's used web components that are just not Polymer? Oh, there we go. All right, um, I'm gonna say something controversial. If you're using Polymer, you're not using web components properly. <laughs> um, and we can duke it out after about that. Um, so then real quick, and I want this to be kind of interactive. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a feed off the audience kind of guy. So um, can anyone name for me the, the four parts of the specification of web components? Shout it out. Shout out. Shout it out. I heard shout it out. Imports. HTML imports. HTML imports. Templates. Templates. The most important one is custom, custom elements. Custom elements. There we go. <laughs> that kind of drives it all. That's right. Okay, good. So that gives me a good idea of kind of where the, where the audience is at and what we're going to talk about. Um, so also, at any time, if you have a question, um, just ask me. Okay. Is that, yeah, okay, that's right. All right, so uh, HTML import shadow DOM, HTML templates, and custom elements. And as you can see here, I have a fancy little uh, graphic of the support level for each of these in the, ma in the major modern browsers. Um, and it's really quite abysmal, isn't it? Uh, the only thing that's, that's all the way down is going to be Chrome. Um, and I'll, I'll share a little quote with you as to why that is and, and also why the others are not that way. <clears throat> Firefox has got OK. Um, can I use says they're at 50%, which is not entirely true because they've only, actually only got one that's not behind a flag. Uh, a couple of the others, I think all the rest of the others are behind a flag, but effectively, um, if it's behind a flag, your users you, you can't use it, so it's worthless. It's great to play with, but you can't actually deploy with it. Um, Edge is catching up real fast, which is very exciting. In fact, the 21st, so just a couple of days ago, Edge in their uh, preview for 13, 13? 13, yeah, um, announced uh, full support for HTML templates. So they were, they were the last holdout, and now they've got it. And so now across the board, HTML templates is supported completely by every major browser. Yay. Um, and Safari is just a black hole, who knows? Um, that'll show up when it shows up. They don't really let us know. So, but good news, guys, we can polyfill all the things. And when we do that, we have support for every major evergreen browser. And in fact, um, the only browser worth mentioning that's not evergreen is IE10. So we can polyfill everything absolutely back to IE10. Um, if you're on the, the browser support model of uh, latest two, IE10's already fallen off the wagon. It's already behind that. And in fact, globally, IE10 is at like 2.63% or something like that. So um, Edge is evergreen, which is awesome, which means we can polyfill all the things with Edge. Um, IE11 is supported in this polyfill. IE10 is supported, but like I said, that may have fallen off. If you have to support IE9, 8, 7, 6, maybe you should just go. <laughs> it's, it's, this isn't going to be very good for you. Um, uh, oh, there we go. All right, so let's talk about the implications of polyfilling. Because polyfilling is great, right? But if we're polyfilling something that's going to have to be in the browser for the next three years, that's maybe a problem. So let's talk about the implications of polyfilling for web components. Um, the individual parts of web components, you adjust the polyfill HTML imports, that's going to cost you 37K or 8K uh, gzip dominified. Shadow DOM, which is the hardest to polyfill, 160K 
or 20 kg zip demidified. HTML templates, it's free 99, y'all. So that's good. Uh, custom elements, we, get it, we can get it for 33K or 8K gzip deminified. And if you want the whole shebang, we can go uh, web, the full web component spec at 258K or 37K minified, um, gzip deminified. Or if we can live without shadow DOM, we can go web components light and go 78 or 16K gzip deminified. So um, who's using Angular? Who's using <laughs> uh, Smaller than Angular. Uh, who's using Angular plus jQuery plus Bootstrap plus Bootstrap UI plus React also and um, you know <laughs> just a hodgepodge? I hope nobody in here, but I have seen that hot mess and that is sad. Um, but you got bigger problems. <laughs> okay, so yeah, o OMG totes like I know right. This is kind of actually not bad. We're GZIP and minifying all of our stuff anyway. We can get the whole thing for 37k. Or 16K. But wait, it gets better. <laughs> um, so that's rad. <coughs> let's, let's take a look at some, uh, a little demo here. I have here a custom a web component that I created. It's just a little weather component. It tells me the weather for something. So let's take a look at what's going on in here. All right, I don't know why Chrome gives me all these iframes, but they're gross. So here we go, web component. You, if, uh, if you've written web components before, you, some of this looks familiar. You see I'm bringing in uh, via an HTML import my web components called weather now, meaning you know weather right now. And here, it, here I am using it, weather now. And I've got these cool little uh, things where I'm passing in some information, my location, my units. You can see that it works. Uh, somebody give me a location. Uh, preferably an airport uh, code because it's easy to type. JFK. JFK. Oh, look, it works. <laughs> so rad, right? Um, we have Shadow DOM. It's behind the, now this is not really fair. This is Chrome, right? So it's already supported everywhere. I'm not using any polyfills in here. Um, but here you go, right? It's the whole thing. We got our, our uh, template in here. Everything's going great. Fantastic. This is the dream, right? Web components. <laughs> Yay. Who's built? Uh, any of this not look familiar? Something strange? Like, what is that weird? No, we're good? That's awesome. Okay. So now I don't know how to go back to my other tab. <laughs> All right. All right, so web components. Sweet. So let's talk about all the good things and the bad things that may be about web components. Um, and I'm sorry, I wrote most of the slides at night after work when I was a little bit loopy, so if some of these jokes don't land, my bad. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so first, let's There's start. Jokes in there? No, not, not yet. <laughs> Just, yeah, wait for it. <laughs> so let's let's talk about HTML imports. Um, the purpose of them. Uh, the purpose of HTML imports is is to really just include HTML in into HTML. It's like HTML inception. It's it's the um, Eric Bled Bledel. Is that how you say it? Um, he he says it's uh, it's like pounding clued for HTML, which I don't really like the reference to PHP there, but um, it's, it's the, how about modules? It's, it's JavaScript modules for HTML, that's much better, uh, which is cool. Um, it's the package component as a single, cons I could look at my screen. Package <laughs> component as a single uh, consumable. It handles dependent, the specification calls for it to handle dependency resolution and cyclical dependency, so all that's solved for, you don't have to worry about it. It pairs exceedingly well with HTTP2, um, which is awesome because it's supported by all the major browsers and uh, all the major servers out there have HTTP2 modules, but who's using HTTP2 in their applications? I don't write, not me either. Why not? I don't know, but we should. So, um, but that's cool. So as that grows, that'll be great. It's less efficient though with HTTP1 um, without something like Vulcanize. So Polymer comes with Vulcanize, which kind of concatenates and minifies your web components, which is nice. Um, but if you're using a lot of web components, you're going to want something along those lines to, to bring them all together. Yeah, in the back. Pardon my ignorance, but what is the advantage over an iframe? Oh, that's actually not, a, not an ignorant question. That's a fantastic question, one that is hotly debated by the browser vendors about web components. So iframes provide you virtually everything that web components provide and a whole lot more. And the problem is the whole lot more. 
Um, the problem is you can there's a lot of overhead to iframes. If you've ever happened to be on a, be on a site that has a whole bunch of like, uh, things on there and someone decided it would be a really good idea to put a Facebook like on every one of those, um, and then you watch your, you know, your fan kick on, your browser start crawling. Iframes are, are really heavy. Uh, yeah, go on. Do, do web components allow resizability? They do. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, that's a good point. So, good point. So it's not all the things. Some of the negative things that come with iframes, well, that's one of the negative. Um, web components tries to be that encapsulation that I, iframes provide, but give, you, give it more part of the document feel. So um, an iframe is like a big hole punch right in the middle of your document into another, it's like a wormhole into another document, right? <laughs> iframes, are, uh, are, sorry, web components are a part of your document. Um, and, the, uh, and when we get the shadow DOM, we'll kind of explain a little bit more about some of these things. But that's, it's actually a really good question. Uh, okay, so HTML imports, um, they, they kind of received some of the most controversy back in December when Mozilla just like emphatically declared, we will not be implementing imports. Uh, and we're like, whoa, hold on, guys. Uh, and they said, we think that um, JavaScript modules are going to inform the discussion around uh, imports a lot. And we're going to wait until uh, ES6 modules are implemented and we learn some lessons from that. We think there's a lot of overlap, which, okay, like, I kind of get that. Um, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel several times, and they're pretty close together, so let's learn some things. It's understandable. Um, they also said, uh, it's also easy to work around, right? We find we don't actually need it from some of the other examples we've done. Which, okay, that's maybe a little more debatable, but we can let kind of the market figure that out. So my problem with their justification is, um, no one's implemented ES6 modules. Nobody even has it on the radar to implement ES6 modules. We don't, know, we don't have a time frame for that yet. It's part of the specification, but no browser vendors have written that yet. So we haven't learned anything yet. So four years into the specification of web components, we don't have any education on, on that. Maybe it would have been a better idea to go with HTML imports and learn that and then implement that. I don't know. But in any case, it's kind of dead on arrival for the moment. Um, at least as far as Firefox is concerned. So, sad kitten. Um, so, but let's talk about how to use it. It's very simple. It's a link tag, a new rel um, value of import, and a path to the HTML file. It's that simple. You can put literally anything, any valid HTML you can put in, in a document, you can put in, in a, uh, an HTML import. So, let's look at that. Is this where? No, that's the one I actually don't have in Well, how about this? So since give, uh, given that Firefox is not going to be implementing it anytime soon, can we live without it? They say we can. Let's find out. Let's look at some code. There we go. I have a whole big hot mess here. All right. Is that big enough? Um, is that the right one? Sans imports? Yeah. OK. Here is uh, my JavaScript for the web component. Or maybe I should show you that too. Uh, ba -dum -ba -dum. Here we go. Here's the web component, the, uh, the import. It's got a template, some stuff, and then reference to a, uh, a JavaScript file. If we look at the JavaScript file, and if I go too fast through this, just yell at me. If I go too slow, yell at me. Just, you know. Yellow. <laughs> um, this, is, this is the JavaScript file for full-on web components, right? It's not terribly long, only 100 lines. Uh, got a lot of white space in there, whatever. Uh, some convenience methods. Um, what I'm doing is here, I'm bringing in the temp. Uh, hold on, what am I getting rid of? I forgot. Imports, yeah. So I've got, the, I've got some references to the current doc, the import script. There's some weird uh, dance you have to do in order to, to, uh, to reference yourself in an import. We have all that, but if we were to get rid of imports, could we still do all of this? Well, it turns out, yeah, you can pretty easily, actually. Um, and it's really a matter of taking the contents of your document, bringing it into your JavaScript. And this was a lot less elegant until ES6, but now with ES6, we have template strings. So um, we can just bring it in there, and now, 
we really don't need the HTML import, so I can still let's write in a way. Let's look at what uh, some things about that though. So, do, do. Oh. so I thought it was really clever with this one, and then someone earlier made this. It's, now it's just lame. So I'm sorry. This will be scattered throughout my presentation. Uh, all it really means is, can we live without it? Can we pull it out? So uh, here are the steps. Actually, we replace the link import with the script tag instead. We pull the script that's referenced out and put that right in the document. We create a template property on the component prototype, which will stand in for the, the, the guts of the template we had in our, in our import. We assign said template property to the value of, of a JS generated template element whose contents is the template content from the import. That's a big mouthful. Um, dynamically create a template element. Document.createElement. Yeah, let me just show you. Um, this one. You see, I create a closure, a document.create element template, template.innerHTML, the contents of my template, return T. And now I don't need the import anymore. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so we have been able to. Uh, let me, let me reframe this whole uh, thing, this whole talk here. The idea is here, the, the topic of this is web component, native web components now, right? And many people are afraid, oh, the web component spec isn't ready yet, and uh, well, okay, but it's actually for specifications, right? So can you use the other parts of the specification, some parts that are more stable? Yes, you can, that is my point. And that we, in fact, should be using web components now in some form or fashion, either by polyfilling or by using what's already there available for us. And I'm going to show you all those options. OK, so we can live without imports thusly. And I've got a cool little quick uh, explanation of how to do that. And here's the git diff. On, uh, and now I wish I had that really cool better git diff tool yeah. that was talked before. Um, but here's the git diff. And I had to, I had to sh cut it out because all the stuff in between that really bad, jaggedy Photoshop job of mine is just the template contents. That's all. So um, that's not a lot of changes from what we had before, is it? Pretty doable, you think? Not bad? I think so. I think it's pretty cool. I like it. Shut up. All right. So, um, so we can get by without templates for now. Cool. We'll wait on Mozilla to wise up. So the next part of the specification is shadow on. Any questions so far? Good. Good yeah. Uh, does it replace the link element, or does it embed within? It meaning the, the template component thingy. The 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 solution for without using a link. Exactly. Yeah. So um, yeah, the idea is. So. In our document, where we would normally drop in the import as a link element, we, we strip that up. We're like, no, never mind. And the way we're now importing the component is via a script tag. So we put the script tag that, that references our JavaScript for the component instead. And so we're doing a little more imperative programming rather than declarative. But we're kind of trying to mix that in with template strings and whatnot. OK. Shadow DOM. What's the purpose of Shadow DOM? It encapsulates the structural implementation of UI, in other words, the HTML. It encapsulates the component styles to prevent leakage, which is gross. We don't like leakage. And uh, it prevents the external environment from accidentally accessing the internal one. In order to get a hold of the Shadow DOM, you have to explicitly say Shadow DOM. You can't query selector it. You can't query selector all it. You can't get elements by ID it. Uh, you have to be very deliberate about getting a hold of the, uh, the Shadow DOM. And in fact, um, you, can, you can close the Shadow DOM by setting a flag um, so that you can't even do that. So you can't even access it like externally to the script that's running it. You can't access the Shadow DOM um, via script. Uh, let's see. Provides a means of composition via node distribution model. Uh, that has changed recently. If you guys are familiar with, the, with the, the, the content and the select attribute, that's gone. It's now slots. And I can talk to you about slots. That was a big controversy, in fact. Um, that's in the slide. I'll talk a little bit about it. So uh, one of the advantages of Shadow Nom, um, 
is that many have seen it as a means of explaining the aspects of how the web works uh, internally. So it's an explanation factor. And then that allows us as developers on the web to kind of emulate the way the web works natively and naturally. And we can kind of feel like we're a part of that. For instance, um, ShadowDOM can explain the select, uh, how the select works, select element works and with the droppy down stuff and selections. Uh, audio and video tags, as well as the, the details element. All these things can be implemented uh, with Shadow DOM and done with just a tag on the page. A custom element in Shadow DOM, but Shadow DOM to abstract that away. And that's part of the goal of the specification, really to explain the web uh, and how it works. So, uh, quote, another quote from Mozilla, they're, they're on one. Uh, web components were a Google effort and little negotiation was made with uh, other browsers before shipping. Yeah. Whoa. Harsh words. <laughs> um, so fortunately, and there's a big history there that's actually really fascinating and fun for like if you want to geek out on it, and I can talk to you guys about that another time, or if we have time later, maybe I'll just ramble on about it. Um, but there was some controversy at the beginning of the year. Uh, some reconciliation was made. Uh, cooler heads got together in March of this year and said, hey, what can we do? Like Google comes like, hey, sorry guys, we really want to get this thing in the browsers. So um, everyone got together and they talked about, okay, what are the contentious parts? What can we, what can we do about this? Um, and they decided to reconvene in July, send out some like assignments and reconvene in July and discuss what happens. Uh, going forward, and that's where the idea of slots and open and closed and whatnot kind of came out of. Um, and they broke Shadow DOM into two versions. So version one, version two, um, and the version two includes more of the imperative stuff. Version one is the declarative side of it. And Chrome, being Chrome, because that's what they do, they already issued uh, just a, a couple weeks ago an intent to ship uh, Shadow DOM version one. So what they decided in July, they've already implemented and are ready to ship it. So they're just eager beavers, aren't they? Um, the other, uh, Mozilla has Shadow DOM behind a flag. So presumably, they're working on updating that to the new version 1, releasing that hopefully soon, because now everybody agrees. And Edge has it under consideration with a high likelihood of implementing. Um, and who knows what Safari is doing about it. Um, here's how you use it. So shadow, uh, you have concepts shadow ho, shadow child, shadowiness. Um, there's also light dom, which we won't talk about right now. Um, so to create, the, you need a, a host for your shadow dom, something where the shadow dom will live. So that's called the shadow host. So we go get an element that needs a shadow. Um, we do some creation to somehow populate the shadow dom with content. In this case, it's called uh, shadow child. It'll be a p element. Uh, so then, in order to create the shadow DOM, we, we do this this element that needs the shadow host that needs the shadow host. We say shadow host dot create uh, shadow root. This now instantiates a shadow DOM container fragment on that element, and then we can just populate that like we would any element with with a pen child or a pen. Um, maybe that should have been a pen child. Sorry, I didn't test that one. So shadow host dot shadow root. There's the explicit part of getting into there. If you'd be explicit about uh, accessing the shadow root dot a pen or a pen child. Questions? Okay. So let's look at that. I think I have this backwards, but all right. So Shadow, Shadow DOM, right? So we've done, let's take a look at this guy here. Oh man, all right. So yeah, this one. Shadow. Create Shadow, there it is, right? Create Shadow Root. So you can see here I got, I went and got the contents of my template. Um, and we'll talk about template in a minute. I create the shadow root on the, the custom element that I've got in here. I do some stuff. I, I, I go get my information based on my attributes. And then I append the information into my shadow root. I do some fancy stuff to make sure that all the things align. And uh, put it in there. And there we go. Yay! And then we have shadow, uh, shadow DOM. And there it is, as you can see. Shut up. Uh, but of course, as you guys might know now, the question is, will it blend? Can we, get a, can we do without Shadow DOM? Maybe you remember from the earlier slides that uh, Web Components Lite does not include Shadow DOM, which implies that, yes, we can do without Shadow DOM. Um, give it away. 
But what might that work look like if we got rid of Shadow DOM? What would we have to do in order to not have Shadow DOM? What's an alternative? It's an open question. Light DOM. Light DOM, which is what, really? Lightsabers. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> it is not lightsabers, no. No. Uh, what about just the. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> the thing I'm about to do, right? <laughs> um, well, well, what about regular old DOM tree? Just child tree to the element, right? Um, so, so we lose the encapsulation of, of shadow uh, roots, right? Of shadow DOM. We, now we're accessible via a query selector and stuff. So it's a trade-off. But we can still attain the same functionality. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but most of the things I write are apps that I control or my team controls. It's not like third-party stuff. I do write some third-party stuff, in which case I have to make some different decisions. But if you're writing an application, you control the DOM. So just put it in a child tree. We can do that. We can just replace all instances, all references to this.shadow root with just this. And there's the diff. Uh, change the comments, so ignore that first part. But you see, I just, everywhere I said th this, I took out the line create shadow root, and everywhere it says this.shadow root, I just say this. I just inject it as a child. Done. Great. Same, same functionality. You want to see what that looks like? Yes, yeah, of course you do. Oh, crap. My hot corner's got the best of me. Oh, cool. Yeah, all right. So let's look at that. Two more time. Look, it still works the same, doesn't it? Let's, let, me, let me prove it before we dive into this thing. OK, give me, a, give me another place. Some place. TXL. TXL. I don't even know what that is. Germany. All right. And it still works, right, guys? Look, no shadow DOM. It's just there. It just, it just works, right? So consider the trade-offs. There are trade-offs. You lose some, you know, some encapsulation and some security. Not the security like, oh my gosh, my user information. But like, you know, just people trampling on your DOM. But if you control your application, maybe that's acceptable. And you can start using web components now. Um, or polyfill it, because then you get shadow DOM. So anyway, considerations. Um, questions? Yeah. Shadow DOM essentially provides document fragments, right? So when you do it without the shadow DOM, it will be slower than if you're using the shadow DOM, correct? Shadow DOM is essentially a document fragment. Um, with the difference that that fragment is attached to an element that then gets kind of rendered on the on the screen. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I mean, with the shadow root, you're waiting for that call, right? <coughs> Whereas when you first bring it in just on the main thing, it's sort of that pops it to the DOM. Uh -huh. So are there two separate, separate processing times, I guess? The oh. shadow DOM kind of sits back until... No, no, actually they're all processed on the same kind of like, you know, event loop uh, stuff. So I don't know that you're going to actually, in fact, if anything, the shadow DOM is going to be slightly slower because it has to kind of like remove stuff and isolate itself. Um, but I, I really don't think it's measurable or by at least a, a human time. Um, I mean, you got Polymer who, again, is, I feel, abusing web components, but they are using web components uh, and doing some really heavy stuff. and. Entire pages are nothing but web components, and you know performance is pretty good. So yeah, yeah. Could you explain what's happening with the location? Because that seems to be two-way binding. Oh, yes, it is two-way binding, um, and it's super cool, guys. Uh, like, this is ES5 stuff, uh, actually. Um, two-way binding is ridiculously easy uh, when you're talking about attributes on nodes. Five minutes. Oh, oh, really? Oh, yeah. man. Holy cow, it's gonna fight fast. All right, so, uh, yeah, no, suffice to say, it's yeah. two-way binding. It's really cool. Object.create, <laughs> getters and setters, that's how you do it. Um, okay, oh, messing stuff up. Okay. Uh, so, no shadow DOM, yay! All right, uh, HTML templates, again, uh, everything, yeah, in the back. Uh, maybe I'm thinking of it even wrong. What, okay. Uh, 
I didn't I didn't understand louder. So Kaha is like a oh. Dom mimicker that rewrites the yeah, the person JS in a way where they think they have access to Dom but they really don't. Okay. And add save is a pre check to make sure they're not actually accessing your document. Okay. Like a static check on the Okay. Could, could that could that stand in for the place of shadow? Yeah. I don't know enough about those, those tools to say. Um, it sounds like that's a, that's a like a, a build time check, not a runtime check, or is it a runtime different, execution time? Different. One actually rewrites code. Uh -huh. uh, the other one um, is a static beforehand. Oh, okay. Yes yeah, it, it sounds like those tools could stand in to to help make sure your development team doesn't trample on stuff, uh, and, and thus provide some of the protections that Shadow DOM already does, but. You know, <laughs> if that if, if that's a problem for not using Shadow DOM and, and you can use that, great. I think that's awesome. Uh, but I I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the tools to say for sure. Uh, okay, so HTML templates. I said before that they're implemented everywhere, so it doesn't really matter. Um, you don't need to polyfill it. Uh, content is effectively inert in templates, though. Uh, they don't render on the page. They're not considered part of the document. Uh, they produce no side effects. Scripts don't run. Images don't load. Audio doesn't play. And template is, uh, can only be activated by deep cloning its content property and uh, then attaching it to the DOM. Um, one thing to note, uh, although it's called HTML templates, it does not have a concept of data binding at all. It is not dynamic. It's just plain DOM, just inert DOM. So thus, the, Polymer steps and says, hey, we can give you a two-way data binding. It's really cool, but so can you. You can do it really easily, guys. Don't really. Um, so it's stored in every major evergreen browser. It's ridiculously easy to polyfill. And by polyfill, I mean actually just kind of patch because you don't get all the same things. But you can have it stand in really easy. And I can show that some other time. Or it's in my code. Um, here it is. Build it. You put anything in a template. Um, and then you get it this way which I've showed you before already. Uh, I'm not going to show that demo. It will blend, although it doesn't need to blend. I, I, show, I show an example in there by creating a fake custom element that I use as a template. But again, it's everywhere, so it doesn't matter. All right, lastly, custom elements. OK, um, the purpose of custom elements, this is where they actually really happen. This is the important bit, custom elements. Um, they define semantic elements as components. Uh, they, you can react to lifecycle events like created callbacks, attached callbacks, detached callbacks, and actually change callbacks. All other standard events are also available to you in the receive config. Uh, you want to receive config through attributes. You want to expose information via custom events. This is how uh, web components are supposed to work. Polymer. Um, <laughs> and and uh, like I said, this is where the real power uh, uh, ex exists. Lifecycle callbacks are red. Oh, little caveat there. So while this is where the power is, you can actually polyfill this too with mutation observers, which is available ev everywhere. Yeah. Okay, so this will also blend if you need it to. Uh, so building it, um, pretty simple. You do uh, document.register elements down here at the bottom. You give it a name. In this case, awesome. Uh, that name has to have a dash in it. Has to in order to prevent collision with future possible elements. And you give it a, a, a config object, which right now only takes one property called prototype, and you give it the prototype of what you want it to, to, uh, to have. Usually that's a, that object itself has a prototype of like HTML element, or if you're going to uh, uh, subclass like button HTML button element or something like that. Uh, and then you attach uh, your callback, your uh, life cycle callbacks on there. So you use it, you drop it in there. The stuff inside of your custom tag is called light DOM, and then you have the potential to project that into your shadow DOM. But that's another thing altogether. Uh, we can talk about that later. Here's an example of data binding right there. There it is. Two-way data binding with attributes. Congratulations. Um, and demo time, you can see now we have, here's an example of the same web component I've been doing this entire time without templates, without um, shadow DOM, without imports, just with custom elements. So who wants to give me a location? T-E-X. T-E-X. X. Oh, like Texas. Look at that, it works. Yeah, Colorado's not bad. <laughs> that's, that's a failing of the API I'm using. So. <laughs> How about this? Well, that's the right one. Dallas, Texas. Or, there we go, Dallas, Texas. Yay. So uh, it also works. 
You can still get it done with just custom elements. It's all you really need. And really, if you don't, if you can't have that, you can still do it with mutation observers. But we don't have to have time for that. So, um, any questions before I'm done? I'm done. But any questions? Oh, wait, crap. Um, so I still need the framework feature to, uh, to do her work. Well, actually, you've got options. Realize you're wrong. Poly you can use Polymer. You can use X tags. You can use Bosonic. You can win use Winston Churchill. So remember to keep comment. Wait. What? What was that last one? Winston Churchill? <laughs> so shameless self-promotion here. I wrote a library for authoring web components called Winston Churchill. It's on GitHub. Check it out. Start it. Uh, submit pull requests, issues, whatever. I'd love uh, to talk about it more. I'm really long-winded on that. It's got a lot of really cool features. That's all. Thank you.